a question right off the bat, and uh, I need you to help me out here. How many of you are not sitting in your right seat? Look, look around. Let me see. Look at the hand. Now, you didn't get permission to do that, okay? You're throwing me off, and uh, the keys are way over here on the outside over there. They're, they, they've had a bad week, you know? Brother Scott, what, uh, <laughs> we, uh, I'm glad you're here, and I, I really am still struggling with the fact that you laughed at my prayer request. I don't know uh, how to feel about that. I hope, uh, I hope today's a good day for you. I love you in the Lord. How about John 14? Let's take our attention there, and I want to uh, begin the thought towards our anniversary Sunday, and particularly our theme uh, for next Sunday, which is simply continue. Our verse comes from 2 Timothy, and I, uh, there in that verse, Paul tells Timothy to continue in the things which thou hast learned, knowing of whom thou hast learned them, and been assured of, that certainly those truths are incredible for Timothy. That thought of continue is really found throughout the scripture, and we find it here in John chapter 14, and I want to address that this morning with you, if I may, and as I consider next Sunday and the weekend, uh, we, we, um, the bottom line is 25 years is actually quite a long time. The Lord has blessed our church with a, a milestone, if you will, uh, for achieving 25 years. God has blessed us. In that 25 years, many of you actually have been here for uh, the majority. Some of you, many of you have been here 20 plus years in our church. And by the way, let, let me say this. Uh, I, I think one of the great marks of a great church are people that stick. I really believe that. And, and by the way, churches... Churches have ebbs and flows, they go up and down, and I understand life changes, but, but a church that's kind of marked by some stability uh, in, its, in its pastors and, and in its congregation, uh, the benefits of that are very great, amen. And we're thankful for that. 25 years of South Wind's history has brought many things. By the way, it's brought uh, many defeats in our church. We've lost some battles in our church. Failed decisions, failed relationships, injury and scars. Mark 25 years. By the way, has anybody been alive more than 25 years? How many of you have been alive more than 25 years? That's the majority. How many of you don't have failed decisions, failed relationships, and scars and injuries? That's life. You know? That's life. Church has life, and life in a church has many of those things that bring with that. Many of you, if you've been here for a number of years, you can reflect on some of those defeats, if you will. And, and in the end, let's remind ourselves of one simple thing about some of those defeats. We have an enemy that's out to cause us to fail and to squander for Christ. Now, in that, we, we understand that, we get that, and we're human. And those defeats are certainly a part of who we are. But we've also had tremendous victories in our church, amen. There's been some tremendous victories. There have been good decisions. We don't even have time uh, to, to label or itemize all of the good decisions, both from the leadership all the way down to, to some of the newest members of our church, such as the Stedman family, who made a good decision to sing in our choir. Amen. Next week they're singing a solo. Maybe a duet. <laughs> Good decisions. There have been lasting relationships that have developed through the years, through the time of the 25 years here at Southwinds. And there's certainly, there's certainly been some healing and, and some forgiveness as well in our midst and in our church. Amen. God has brought us through uh, some, some difficult times. We, we find ourselves enjoying the life of a church and, and going through both defeats and Victories. By the way, let's, let's be honest as well. Both defeats and victories are good for us. Through our defeats, we learn to trust God. We learn to understand faith. We understand the love of our God. And our defeats are, are critical for us at times. Certainly the victories that God gives us as well. By the way, those 25 years uh, also include a, 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 a number, hundreds. I have no idea. Hundreds if not thousands of people coming to Christ in salvation. What a great truth that is. What, what a great testimony. By the way, churches ought to be marked for their gospel witness. They ought to be known as people who are wanting to share the gospel with people in our community and with those who would come into our doors. And there have been souls who have been saved through the years. There have been lives that have been changed. 
And certainly, I think more important than all the things for us, life changed and souls saved and, and all those things, I think there's been one thing, I pray, that has been consistent for 25 years, and that is simply this, that in all of our days, that God gets the glory. God gets the glory. There is no man capable of receiving or, or should receive the glory for what's happened in this place. Not one. I'm so privileged, and I've said it a thousand times, I'm so glad to have the Claytons with us. I tell you, in my heart, I, I just joy in the fact that our founding pastor is here. I, I, I really enjoy the place of being a pastor that gets to honor our founding pastor and still have him here. Amen. But I know that man's heart, God still gets the glory. God still gets the glory. Those 25 years have been a number. I've been going through photographs. I've been going through the history of our church. And, and I've had the privilege of being a part of about a third of that. And uh, I go, went kind of reminiscing the last months and uh, looking through different things. And I'm, I'm just so grateful that, by the way, there's a ton of people I don't have never met before that have been part of this church. And that's okay. By the way, there's a ton of people I believe in the future that are going to be a part of our church. And we're excited about that and the joy that we have of being a part of something so great. But I want to ask a question this morning. I, as we dive into John 14, there's really about three verses there I want us to have a focus on. It begins in verse number 14 there. These are very familiar verses to you. Actually, verse number 16 is where I want to jump in. And he says, I will pray the Father, and he will, shall give you another comforter uh, that, uh, that, that, ye may, uh, that he may abide with you forever. Even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but ye know him, for he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. I will not leave you comfortless, I will come to you. Boy, in these verses, there, there's so much content. We don't have the time this morning to dive into the, the full depths of, of, of what God Christ indicates. And he makes an interesting statement. I'll pray that God will give you another comforter, verse 16. But then he says, verse 18, I'll come to you. By the way, that's a tremendous Christ-given example of the Trinity of the Godhead. I'm going to pray the Father. He'll send you another comforter, which we know without a doubt to be the Holy Spirit of God. Verse 26 confirms that there in the context, that another comforter will come. But then he says, I am going to come to you. But what an incredible view of the Godhead and, and Christ understanding not only his place in the Trinity, but the equal value of the other parts of the Trinity, certainly God the Father and the Holy Spirit of God. But I wonder this morning as we consider this idea that the theme of continue is found here in this idea of, of really forever. This continuing on. I, I thought about this question. Have you ever thought about this? Have you ever wondered how long you would have to do something? You ever asked the question how long you would have to do something? By the way, how many of you have asked that question before? That's a really pretty generic question. Surely every one of you have asked, how long do we have to do this? My wife and I were kind of joking about this. But you, know, you know the first thing that came to my wife's mind? I asked her, I said, how long do we have to do this? She says, I wonder how long I have to change diapers. Moms, you remember that time when your kids were little? And by the way, we had four kids. We had three of them in diapers all at the same time. Man, it was like a herd of cattle running through there, you know, just take that off, put this on, you know. But well, man, of that, we got pretty efficient with it. We, we, could, we could change diapers on the run, you know what I'm talking about? I uh, wonder how long, I remember the day when our youngest was out of diapers. I know Morgan loves to hear this story. It's tremendous for her, I know. And I wonder, I remember when she got out of diapers, my wife and I high-fived each other. She is now potty trained. We don't have to do this any longer. No more diapers. I wonder, have you ever asked the question about how long you have to do this? How about, how many of you ask, and I, this is really a tricky question. Have you ever wondered how long you have to sit through a graduation? How many feel that have asked that question at a graduation? Let's be honest. By the way, if you didn't vote, you're lying. Those graduations, you're like, yeah, you know, praise the Lord. Ah, yeah, I'm so grateful for all the 10,000 other kids, you know. Just say my kid's name, you know, so we can, right at it. graduations, got to love them. 
<laughs> Here's one. Have you ever wondered how long you'd have to stand on the driver's license line? <laughs> By the way, there's a big new store on Spring Cypress Road there. You been to that new store out there? It's amazing. My wife and I had to renew our license this past year. And uh, I've, uh, you know, let's pray about this before we go. You know, we go there. I'm, I, I, I packed a lunch, you know. And we're at the driver's, I'm missing from start to finish, this is no joke, start to finish, 15 minutes. 15 minutes. I gave my lunch to somebody else. I walked in there, we were walking out. Both of us had our renewed licenses in 15 minutes. I couldn't believe that. I was shocked. I, I was prepared to spend the day, and I was prepared to have a timeout prayer time, you know, and, and not be mad at people, and, you know, not be mad at the government, and all these things. How long do we have to do that? And I know some of you are asking this right now. How long is this service going to last? <laughs> I know you're asking that. I know you are here. How long do we got to be here and listen to you talk? Boy, I surely wondered that yesterday. How long is this football game going to last? <laughs> Man, my son, we're sitting in the stands. You know, this is a cakewalk. We're going to win this game. And next thing you know, by halftime, I was like, what time? You got to get out of here. It's terrible. How long? I wonder, have you ever wondered how long you have to do this thing called Christianity? You ever wondered that? How long do we have to do this thing called Christianity? I think, honestly, many people deep in their hearts, we would never admit that, but I think sometimes we reach points where we ask that question. How, how, you know, how long am I expected to keep this up? But I, I would venture to say that during the 25 years of our history, that question has been asked by many people. How, how long do we got to keep doing this? How, how long can we endure and continue? How, how long am, am I expected to continue to do the things that God has asked me to, to do, this, these, and, and, and the, these things that God requires of me? And wh whether we think of it as a requirement or an, a privilege, or the fact is that Christianity just continues on and on. And I think here in John 14, in an incredible moment in our Lord's life and in the life of his disciples, let's remember John 14 is the context of that is the night of, of the, Lord's, uh, the Lord's Supper there in the upper room. It's the night of the, the, the betrayal by Judas Iscariot. It's the night of, of his arrest and all the, you know, through the night, that long evening and night of his, his uh, court and all those different things. And then ultimately, early in the morning, being crucified on Mount Calvary. This is that night. And the Lord, as he understands, certainly the situation at hand, he's trying to tell his disciples, listen, guys, listen, this has to keep going. You know, I've been with you now three and a half or so years, and, and here we are. It, it is the climax and the crux of the entire plan of God right now. And I need you to understand that this has to go on. We have to keep this up. And in these verses, we find some incredible truths about uh, this, this idea of continue, and certainly for these disciples and for ourselves uh, to understand the importance of continuing for the Lord. Let's consider verse 16, and there's a couple of words here that really mean a lot to us, or they should. They should kind of stand out. Verse 16, I'll pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you, what? Forever. How long is Forever. You know, uh, let's be honest, everlasting life is pretty long. <laughs> and, you know, you think about today, we go through particular days and particular circumstances and we wonder, you know, is this ever going to end? Sometimes it's, it's just really difficult and we find ourselves in the midst of some terrible situations at times and, and we wonder, is this ever going to end? By the way, my wife and I, uh, this year as well, celebrated our 25th wedding anniversary. Amen. 27 of them have been happy. Amen. We've been together 29 years, 25 years of marriage. What our mom and dad was thinking when we were so young, I have no idea because I'm only 28. <laughs> the point is that my wife and I celebrated an anniversary and, and I was we were kind of reflecting on our 25 years and, and we, we kind of have these moments. Remember, uh, in 1994 in, in our life, in our married life, started off with a bang. Taylor was born. February 23rd was a snowy day, cold day in Springfield, Missouri. 
And we went to the hospital that morning, about 7 o'clock we arrived, and, and the next thing you know, Taylor, uh, she's there about 3 o'clock in the afternoon. I remember thinking, my daughter was born at, at, at 3.50, I think, actually was when she was born. I still remember that, by the way. And uh, I remember just the joy, the overwhelming emotion and the joy of, here's my daughter. And, and she, of course, the, the nurses then took her and did all they had to do with her. And my wife, I tried to make sure my wife was okay and that she was resting. And I remember my mom and dad said... It's, it's dinner time. Have you haven't eaten all day? I was like, no, I, I haven't thought about food one time today. That's not the point today. They're like, well, it's dinner time. Let's, let's kind of go out. Let's kind of relax and let's take a deep breath and, and let's go find some dinner. We'll, we'll visit. My wife was cared for. She was resting. My daughter was, was perfect and resting and being cared for. My mom and dad and I went to the restaurant someplace. I have no idea where it was. We sat under the table and all my emotion incredible joy, incredible fear, you know, all of the emotions and the joy of the moment. And I remember thinking, if I could plan for all of my future kids to go to the hospital at 7, be born by 3, and still have dinner, <laughs> who, who wouldn't want that? I mean, that's okay. Be there by 7, kids born at 3, dinner at 5.30. That's a pretty good plan. I remember the emotions, but I kind of remember from, from February 24th through the rest of 1994, not a good year. <laughs> Honestly, it had very little to do with my daughter. My daughter had some complications. It was, it was strange stuff. It was simple. We couldn't put our finger on it, but it was a difficult year. Can I tell you that that rest of that, when we hit Christmas of 94, my wife and I kind of looked at it just like, we need a new year. 95 has to be better. Have you had those years? Our church has had those years. And you think about the continued part. You think about what it means forever. Well, we have those marks in life, 25 years. Let's be also be honest here that 25 years is a long time, but in the scheme of things, 25 years is just like that. I mean, if you've been married 25 plus years, on to 50 years. Matter of fact, we've had a couple of, uh, this past, past week, we've had a couple of 50 years, the petties, had theirs a little more than a week ago. The Burtons had your 50th. When was that? The second, a couple days ago. Both of them celebrating 50 years of marriage. Give them a hand for that. That's a good thing. That's a good thing. I know many of you couples have been married for uh, approaching or have now passed that 50-year mark. And, but what's incredible about these two couples, they've all been happy about 37. Amen. Yeah, 25, Brother Billy says. Yeah, 25. It's 50-50. Amen. Man, praise the Lord. The 25 years for, in God's con, you know, consideration is, is really just a drop in the bucket. Remember what the scripture says, that one day with the Lord is as what? And, and, and a thousand years is as what? Think of how long it will take us to get to 25 years. Oh, what an incredible concept. When God says to his disciples here, I'm going to give you another comforter, and he will be with you and abide with you. That's, that's the key word in verse 16. The word abide means to continue or to remain, and he'll be with you forever. But matter of fact, a week or so ago, I, I shared this last Sunday night, there was a photograph taken at one of these celebrations, I think it was the Petties, and there was a few couples that were involved in this picture. Uh, and the couples represented 367 years. Is that right, Brother Wade? 360, how many? 375 years. We've had some anniversaries since then, amen. 375 years of marriage in these few couples that were there. And by the way, let's be honest, that's, that's unique in our day and age. That's unique. And the reality of, of enjoying time and celebrating uh, what God wants to celebrate, this concept of continuing and doing it for a number of time, a number of years. Marriage has become kind of the, the example this morning. And I was reading an article this past week from the Huffington Post. It was presented in November of 2014. And it was a particular report about marriage and, and, and concerning marriage, particularly on divorce and remarriage, and I understand 
uh, that many folks, many Christian folks have been affected by divorce. And I, I sure want to be careful how I present this information. But, it, but here's what the report shared. Uh, that this, this Pew report uh, uh, on who is likely to get remarried. And here's what some of the data said. It said that in today's times, that uh, in new marriages, 40% of, 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 of the marriages, one of the spouses have been married before. Of new marriages, 40% have been married before. Uh, 20% of those marriages have both spouses that have been married before. What the data reveals is that the number of remarried adults just in the U.S., in 2014 was 42 million adults. Now, now here's, what's, here's what's incredible about that. Since 1980, that's double. Double. Since 1960, that's tripled. Tripled. And, and the, the reality is that, that since the 50s, folks, marriage has been under attack. Even before that, but since the 50s, America is, has been experiencing the, the decay and, and the, if you will, the ruining by our enemy, the attack on such a holy, sanctified institution of God called marriage. And in our country today, we're finding where nearly half, nearly half of the new marriages are contain people who have been remarried or married before. And now let me say this because I want to make sure this is clear. It's not about whether you've been remarried or not. And here's the thing. The mentality in our country and in our world today is telling us and teaching our our children and that the baseline of marriage is if it doesn't work out, shuck it off and go find another one. That's kind of the mentality of the world in which we live. Here's my point. God says, no, 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 that's not the way to look at this thing called marriage. What we need to look at this marriage thing is this thing is forever. Can I get an amen on that? Now, I understand if you have been marred by divorce, I want to tell you right now, it, here's the question for us. If you've been divorced before, it's not about whether you've been married and divorced. The question is, how is your marriage mentality today? How is your marriage mentality today? Is it a forever thing or is it simply a trial run? Do we have the mentality of life, that life is temporary, and the things that we do for God, the things that God says is valuable to us, or do we look at those things as being a temporary trial run in life? God says here, when it comes to giving you the Holy Spirit, this other comforter, this thing is one and done. This thing is forever. When this happens in your life, there's no going back. There's no reversing the process. There's no unpaying the paid price. There's no reversing the situation. There's no going back on your word. There's no contract to tear up. There's no law to, to violate. There's nothing that can be done in the eyes of God when God says to us, this thing of the comforter and you and him abiding in you is forever. It's forever. Now you think of God, when you think about marriage as a simple example, I wonder, uh, I wonder how long God will keep his promise. You see, because he says here, I'm going to pray to the Father, and, and he's going to give you another comforter. And this, this is a promise, I'm telling you. By the way, 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 1 makes an incredible statement. It says, God cannot lie. So, so when Christ says, I'm going to ask the Father, he is going to send you another comforter and it is forever, we naturally begin to lean on this idea possibly that God won't keep his promise. That God's not going to fulfill his end of the deal and his end of the bargain. And we become to wonder, I wonder how long God will keep his promise. The simple answer to that is, is really, really simple. God will always keep his promise. Aren't you glad that God is still with us today? Aren't you glad the God that we're worshiping here this morning, that our hearts are drawn to by spirit and by truth, and that we come to worship, aren't you glad it's the very same God that Moses spoke with on top of Mount Sinai? It's the very same God that Daniel prayed to in, in, in the lion's den. It's the very same God that, that David spoke with on a number of occasions. It's the very same God that meant Paul in the Damascus way. It is the same God. And God said, I promise you, I will be with you forever. 
And that is an incredible truth because when we think about continuing on and we think about abiding with God and how long are we supposed to do this church thing? How long are we supposed to do this Christian thing? How long are we supposed to sing? How long do we open the Bible? How long do we preach the Word of God? How long do we evangelize the lost? How long do we have concern for the things of God? How much do we value things like marriage and family? How long do we do that? God would say, you do it forever. You do it forever. That's the way it works. As God is honest to keep His promise, It helps me to be steadfast. He is steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, 1 Corinthians 15 and 58 would say. And being steadfast on this truth where God says now, this thing is forever. Let's just remind ourselves that because we have the Spirit and we're able to abide with God as God abides with us, there's a couple of simple reminders. We do this regardless of emotions. By the way, let's be honest. Again, this is not an anniversary weekend because we have two other preachers next Sunday. I don't get to talk to you much. Uh, Let's be honest. I want to raise raise of hands. How many of you have been really angry with your church? Have you been angry with your church before? Come on, anybody? By the way, my hand is up. There have been Sundays I have left church and my spirit is angry. You know why? I'll be honest with you, I'm the pastor. I know that person right over there, they're not right with God and that message should have spoke to their heart and they should have come got right with God. And Lord knows I'm the Holy Spirit. (laughs) Did you know I've been upset and angry with the church? You know why? Because the pastor made the wrong decision and I was the pastor. Well, you ought to see me on Monday mornings. Come by Monday mornings for a cup of coffee, and you'll see me in a whole different state. Amen. Angry, emotion. How many of you have been so thrilled with your church you couldn't hardly stand it? Couldn't wait to come back next time? Well, I think one of the most enjoyable phrases that I hear as a pastor is, I can't wait to come back. And by the way, that's not because we sing the right songs or we preach the right message. That's because I believe that somewhere in the process here, there's a person called the Holy Spirit of God that's involved with what we're doing, and he's prying on people's hearts saying, hey, this is the right thing. This is the right thing to give yourself to, and this is a good thing. It's a good thing. Our emotions, though, our emotions, good or bad, our emotions often are are not the place to decide whether we're going to continue with God. Our emotions are unstable. How about this one? We need to be steadfast regardless of other people. Regardless of other people. Let me be honest with you again. You know any people have left at Southwinds? Good or bad? Moved away? Got mad? Upset? By the way, it's never the preacher's fault. <laughs> people have walked away for whatever the reason. They're not here any longer. Uh, and by the way, Southwinds is not the only church on the planet. Amen. But here's the point. Here's the point. You need to be steadfast in your place for God, in your walk with God, regardless of anybody else. Regardless of anybody else. If you're deacon, if you're deacons of your church, that we have seven men, good men who love the Lord. If the seven men decide tomorrow, we are not going to be here any longer. We do not believe that anymore. We are walking out the door. So the first thing some people think about, oh man, how much money left? Can we afford it? Please understand, God has enough money. If your pastor decides tomorrow, I don't believe that anymore, I'm walking out the door, I'm not coming back. Listen, you come next Sunday, because some man will stand in this pulpit and preach a good word of God. Amen. You stay your place, regardless of other people and regardless of emotion. By the way, if people come in here in our church and say, hey, you're believing the wrong way. Here's the way you ought to believe. Listen, we're going to stick to our guns in the Bible. Amen. So regardless of others, let's just keep going on. Let's just keep doing what we know is right. Let's just keep doing the things that we know from the Scripture honors God and gives God what's rightfully due to Him. And in the end, let's just do that. Let's stay there in our place and let's continue serving the Lord. 
How about regardless of the world? Be a steadfast regardless of the world. Let's be honest. If you read the Bible, the end of the world doesn't look very good. I mean, the direction of our world is not a good direction. It's not just an American problem, by the way. It's not just an American problem. We know the, head, the, the direction of our country and of our government. By the way, here's a, here's a big rock in the calm waters of American patriotism. Listen, the end times are not about America. They are not. By the way, I'm as patriotic and loyal as anybody on the planet, but I'm going to be honest with you. Honest, I, I'm not as concerned about America as I am concerned about staying with Christ. And in the end, the direction of our world is not a good direction. And when you read the scriptures and understand the end times conditions, things like apathy take over the world. They take over the mentality of churches. Not just the world, but the mentality and the emotions and the passions and the hearts of people who claim to be Christian and claim to be in love with God. Apathy is the condition of the end times. What that means is simply this, that the more time passes, there's a greater chance that less people will be here. That's what that means. Some of you in 25 years, as kind as I can say it, some of you in 25 years won't be alive. You'll be on in heaven in glory with the Lord. And uh, 25 years from now, I'll be 70. Almost 71. And if I'm still the pastor here, Lord willing, then we'll find ourselves at 70 trying our best to remember the last 25 years. <laughs> Amen. I'll have to take more notes. <laughs> See, uh, who was that, honey? Who was that person? <laughs> the point being that regardless of others, regardless of your emotion, and regardless of the world, God wants us to do it forever. Do it for your life. Make that decision. And that decision's a good decision. Let me point out a second thought to you really quick there. Verse number 17. He says there, even the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him. But ye know him, for he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. Here's our second point, real simple. This is an incredible outline this morning. Point one's forever. Point two is because of him, or because of me, the Lord would say. You're going to be able to do this because of me. Because I'm going to come to you, the Spirit of God is going to be there. And the only way for you to know God and continue doing what you're doing is because of Christ. There's no other way around that. In other words, let's say it this way. In other words, there's no way to guarantee. There's no way to guarantee that you'll still be in your place a year from now unless, unless you choose to walk with Christ. That's the only way. In the next year, there is a plethora of decisions, a plethora of problems, a plethora of, of issues that no doubt will arise that will challenge your steadfastness and your continuing unless Christ is in charge of your life. And the Lord tells these disciples, I'm praying the, the Father that he'll give you a comforter and he'll be there with you forever. But in the end, in the end, the only way that you know God is through the Holy Spirit. And the only way that will do it forever is through the Holy Spirit. And the only way that you'll understand is because you understand me. Now in that truth, it's a really simple thing. The Lord becomes everything to us. The Lord becomes everything as far as what we do here. Again, we're, we're not, uh, but please understand, in, in terms of our church worship and what we're doing here, listen, it is not about social acceptance. It's about honoring the Lord Jesus Christ. I really could care less about social acceptance. I don't care if every other church in town likes what we believe. I don't care about that. What I'm concerned about is this Christ. Is he pleased with what we are doing here in this place? Because that's what matters. That's what matters. By the way, is that right or not? That's important for us. And I, I have no intention of being some weirdo down here at Southwinds. I mean, that's not our intention. That's not our goal. 
But the fact of the matter is that there's nothing going to happen without the Lord Jesus Christ. I want you to hold your finger in John, and I want you to turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. And I want you to see this particular point illustrated through the Corinthian letter. And as Paul would write to the Corinthians, he, he, he writes an incredible truth here. This is found in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. And uh, as he's writing, telling these Corinthians about the importance of Christ. And um, get down to verse number 30. We'll get right to the verse. The verse says, But of him, that, that's God, of God are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God is made unto us. So God has taken Christ and he has made him certain things for us. He has made him certain truths unto us. He has made unto us, now notice here, the four things. Wisdom, righteousness, sanctification, and redemption. Christ is made these things. Now, now by the way, Christ entails many things, but here in the context, God lists four things for us. And he says that Christ is these things unto you. Now, let's let's put that together. Let's connect the dots. That, That if God says, I want you to abide, and I've given you this spirit to abide with you forever because I want you to carry this on, then the reality is there's no way to do that without Christ being made for you what you need. Now in that, he says, he has been made wisdom unto us. Wisdom is a wonderful study in the Scriptures. And the word wisdom is used a couple of different ways. And I've taught this before, but it it needs to be reiterated and said again. Wisdom is used really a couple of ways. There's the wisdom of men, and there's the wisdom of God. Matter of fact, 1 Corinthians chapter 1 compares those two wisdom styles, if you will. And, and, and God, by the way, the wisdom of God makes the wisdom of men foolishness. Men are incapable of generating enough wisdom to even scratch the hem of the garment of the wisdom of God. His ways are not our ways, and his thoughts are higher than our thoughts. And in the end, when God says, I have made Christ wisdom for you, Now, that means a couple of things. That means that as a Christian, we ought to have enough wisdom to get out from under the rain. You ever seen a lost man who can't do that? Now, you know, the physical sense. But there's some lost people who don't have enough wisdom for some of the most basic issues of life. Have you noticed that? Matter of fact, Romans chapter 1 says it this way. That in their wisdom, they changed the image of God into an idol. But please understand, in man's wisdom, in his own wisdom, he has enough wisdom to think. Let's take God and let's make him into an idol. Now God says to us very clearly, there shall be no idols before you. No graven images of myself. Amen. And yet lost men, men in general... Don't have the wisdom enough to understand God. None seeks after God. Romans chapter 3 declares. So some men have not enough wisdom to do the very simple, basic things in life. But, But here's the other thing. The wisdom of Christ in our life looks like to the world, looks like foolishness. But to God, it's actually the most basic decisions of life. To God, the wisdom of God that comes through Christ, it's a basic thing and a simple thing to simply obey what God simply instructs. God calls that wisdom. The world calls that foolish. The world says it's foolish to believe by faith that Christ is the Savior. God says that's the most basic, simple, wise thing you could do. For God, it's wisdom. Let me try to be more simple. For God, or another another example. For God, it's simple wisdom, simple wisdom to praise God when we're assembled together. That's a simple thing. Men, men in their wisdom turn worship time into a selfish thing. Where now, I don't like that kind of worship. 
Can I get an amen on that? Well, I don't like that kind of worship. Well, God says, when, when did it become about you? When did you become wise enough to decide what's worship for me and what's not worship for me? When did you become wise? Men think they have the wisdom to fix God's word. Listen, men don't have the wisdom to fix God's word. Well, let's come to one more baseline conclusion. God's word doesn't need fixing. God's word doesn't need fixing. But men think they can make it better. Please, men don't make it better. Men make it worse. Men make it worse. And in the end, the simple things of God, the simple wisdom of God, God says it's just a simple thing that you would abide and continue serving me and obeying me for the rest of your life. That's a simple thing, but it's only through the wisdom that comes through Christ. Only through Christ. Many people have decided that church is no longer a valid, important, beneficial thing. Many people have decided any longer that organized church is no longer what I need. I don't need that. I needed to do what I wanted to do. Listen, this church and this assembly, again, it is not about us. It is about the Lord Jesus Christ. And when God says to assemble ourselves, that's what God means. Amen. The point of wisdom. He also says there in Corinthians that he has made righteousness unto us. Righteousness in the scripture is the quality of being right. Right in character and, and ultimately right in behavior. Please understand, there is no righteous character and no righteous behavior without Jesus Christ. There is no good person in this world without Christ. Bible. That's why we have to, as a church, we have to keep preaching the gospel. Because the gospel tells men that by yourself and as you are, you are a sinner and you're under the guilt and condemnation of your sin and you will spend eternity without God. But through Christ, you can be righteous. The righteousness of Christ can be given to you through faith and faith alone. And through the righteousness of Christ, then your behavior begins to mean something. Amen. Christ has made unto us wisdom, righteousness, sanctification, certainly redemption. Christ has made redemption. Christ has been made the price paid for sin. Christ is your propitiation. Christ is the price. Christ is the only thing. Christ is the only thing that is acceptable to God. Therefore, you are only acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Now, he says there in John that he's going to abide with you, and it's because of Christ. I am going to come to you. Peter, you're not going to get this done unless I come to you. It's not going to continue if we don't send another comforter. It's not going to continue if the Father doesn't grant it to us, and it has to happen through Christ. Therefore, the comforter is that intercessor or that advocate. And he says, I will not leave you comfortless in John 14, 18. And he says, I will not leave you comfortless. The word comfortless in Scripture means orphaned. I will not leave you fatherless. By the way, let's remind ourselves of another important truth about continuing. We have the best father ever. I will not leave you comfortless. Abiding with God and doing what we do forever is because we have a God in heaven that is more than just an image on a shelf. He is more than just a force in the world. He is more than some mythological thought in the minds of men. He is more than a doctrine put on paper. He is more than a statement that we, we uh, sometimes imagine in our life. He is more than all that. He is a God that is your Father. And as your Father, He sees everything you do. He loves you to the core. And he is with you all the time. He is the best father ever. Going back to the illustration of marriage, do you know what that means in our country then? 42 million adults who have been remarried. 
I wonder how many kids that represents. I wonder how many families and children that that represents where kids now are growing up and living in a marriage, in a family, if you will, that, that struggles with an identity of a father that is a good father. Let me, let me qualify that statement. Some of you have been remarried, and as men, you are good stepfathers. You're Christian men who have a heart for God, and you're good stepfathers. You're doing your best with your stepchildren, and you've done your best to raise stepchildren. Same with some of you ladies. But let's be honest, let's be honest, that, that children are growing up with somewhat of a misidentity of a father in heaven that is completely good for them. Can I get an amen on that? And God says, I won't leave you that way. Now, by the way, the struggles that we face in America with divorce and remarriage and broken homes and kids struggling to know fathers and who's their dad. By the way, in our country, the idea of fathers taking on a whole new look. And the challenge we have is to remind them that our God's promise is it will be because of me, because I will not leave you in a condition by yourself. I will be sure that you have an advocate and I will make sure that you are not orphaned, that you are not parentless, and that me as your father will be good for you so that you can continue. I even today... Uh, Many of you again know my, my father passed away about four years ago, a little more than four years ago. My dad's picture is on the shelf by my desk. And you know, still to this day, I know this sounds crazy, but some of you, will, I know you'll understand. To this day, I walk into my office, and about three days out of the week, I'll say, hey, Dad, how you doing? And I feel like my dad's watching me. That sounds creepy to some, completely normal to others. Let me say it this way, because that's how I feel in my heart. I walk into my office and I see my dad's picture, and guess what? My dad was a good father, and I have every desire in my heart to please my father because my dad loved my God. And between my earthly father and my heavenly father, I sit down at my desk and I open God's word and I read and I study and I pray. You know why? Because I have a father that motivates me to continue. Now, by the way, how do you see your father? How do you see your relationship? How do you understand when God says this thing is a forever thing? Have you ever asked the question, how long do we have to do this? Have you ever wondered how long we have to endure? Please understand, the world is giving you every reason why not to. And God is giving you every reason as to why. Why you should. Continue. Certainly because it's forever and certainly because of the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, I want to ask you a simple question then and really twofold. First of all, do you know Christ as your Savior? Because the simple conclusion we can draw from the passage is that if you're not saved, if you don't know Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, then you abiding for Christ and serving Christ, that's not even the right question. That, that's not even the right issue. The issue now is, do you have a relationship with Jesus Christ? Do you know Him? Have you experienced the saving grace and mercy of God Almighty to save you from your sin? If not, if not, God wants to save you. God really simply wants you to believe in Him and trust what He has done through Jesus Christ. And, and through Jesus Christ, your sin has already been paid for. And through Jesus Christ, with faith in your heart, God has promised to save you. It's the most incredible decision you would ever make. And oh, by the way, let's remind ourselves, when you make the choice to believe in Christ, it's forever. It's forever. But maybe you Christians, you're, you're considering, how long do I have to do this? I've heard some Christians make this statement. Well, I've already done that before. I've spent my time. Please understand, there is no end to your time. There is no end to your time. Amen. It's for the long haul. It's for the long term. And God wants you to remember, I'm there for you forever, and you need to be there for my cause.
forever. You agree with that this morning? Father, we love you, Lord. We thank you for the morning. Father, thank you again for this wonderful truth. Father, I pray this morning that you would look into our hearts and challenge us, Lord, with this concept of continuing on. Father, we, we acknowledge the fact that it's not an emotional decision. Father, it's not based on an experience. Father, in the end, it's a long term. It's a life given. And Father, I pray that you would challenge us with that today. Father, as we begin to celebrate 25 years. Father,
Father, help us to remember. And Father, we pray and we acknowledge the fact that without Christ, Lord, there is no continuing on. That through Christ and Christ alone. Father, I pray for those there this morning that may be lost. Or that they would hear the gospel message of your love for them. Of your provision for their sin through Christ. And that, Father, the challenge to every individual is they would choose by faith to believe in Jesus Christ. And, Father, I pray for the believer today as well. Or that you would encourage us. Father, let our experiences give way now. Or let our memories of defeats remind us, Lord, of the strength that we find in Christ. And, Father, may all of our victories and all of our times of celebration be given to an almighty God. Lord, I pray that in our hearts we'll make a choice to continue on for you. We love you, Lord. Have your will away in every heart. And we certainly ask and pray these things now in Jesus' name.